Welcome to the Sunday Morning Message with Pastor Nick Stringer, brought to you from Creekside Church in Brookville, Indiana. Creekside Church, where the Spirit flows. Open your Bibles, if you would please, to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, and today we finish up our sermon series, Chasing the Wind, that has focused on what I like to refer to as a diary of a king, a man who had the world by the tail, who had everything that his eyes desired and his flesh desired. He had it all, and yet he came to the conclusion at the end that life is nothing unless we fear the Lord and keep his commandments. Today's message is titled, Goads and Well-Driven Nails. A goad, as you can see right there in ancient times, was a long stick with a sharp prick on the end of it and it was used to maintain control of large animals mostly oxen back in the time uh, in order to direct them and to get them to move uh, what direction that they would want them today uh, you might call that a cattle prod and it might be electric uh, that you would use on cattle also well-driven nails and when you think of a well-driven nail you think of a wood or a piece of wood and a nail being driven into it and it's securely being held in place by that nail. This is, uh, this is used, goads and well-driven nails, by Solomon here to describe the wisdom that comes from the scriptures. The Bible offers us wisdom that corrects us like a goad and also keeps us stable and secure like a well-driven nail. We live in a world that's lost to sin. We live in a culture that is rapidly in decay. And we need the wisdom of Scripture to not only go at us when we need it, but to also stabilize us like a well-driven nail. And so that's what we'll be focusing on here today. Our principle for this morning is our best life is lived fearing the Lord and walking wisely in his ways. And we can apply that principle to our lives by committing to making adjustments in our talk and in our walk to show our reverence for God. So Ken Lidekin last week had mentioned fearing the Lord and what that had meant. And he mentioned also that it meant to have reverential awe, a reverence for God. A healthy fear of God. You know, fire can be a very horrifying thing, but it can also be a very useful thing. A fire can destroy forests and buildings, but it can also light up a dark room. A volcano, it can cause massive amounts of damage when it explodes, and yet it can also make islands right over at Yellowstone National Park the Park Service recommends and I'm quoting here that visitors stay at least 25 yards away from wild animals like bison and elk and 100 yards from bears and other carnivores at all times despite this there have been multiple bison attacks at Yellowstone and tourists frequently disregard the park's rules and try to touch or get too close to the wild animals and miss showing the proper respect or fear. And that's exactly the type of healthy fear that we need to have for the Lord. Okay? We need to have a proper understanding that God is in control of all things, all matters. He is all powerful. And yet we need to have a healthy understanding of knowing His character. He is the type of God who is willing to forgive our iniquities willing to forgive our sins, willing to look past all of our mistakes if we surrender to his plan and his purpose, his son, Jesus Christ, for the salvation of our souls. I would like you to turn to the book of Hosea. This is a life-changing verse for me personally, and I wanted to share it with you because it taught me a lot about the character of, of God and who God is. It's Hosea chapter 6 verse 6 and I'm going to read it. You can just write that verse down and you can look it up later. 
says this, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice. And you may want to underline that loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Another good point to underline. What God is saying there is that our works, our sacrifices, our burnt offerings mean very little to him, if nothing at all, without our heart. Listen, we're coming up on a season here. We're going to have a, a chicken dinner. Okay, October 2nd, a couple Sundays from now. What God expects for us is to glorify him in that event. God's not concerned with how many chickens we sell. God's not concerned with how much money that brings in. God has all the money. He can give us whatever he wants, whenever. What he's concerned with is, are my people going to glorify me in this event? Are we going to unify and work in kindness? Are we going to exemplify the character of God and shine the light of Jesus during this event? That is what God is concerned with, and that is where the blessings come from. You see, it's not oftentimes the work that we do. It's how we do it. That's what God is concerned with because God will do miraculous things when we have the proper attitude to do them. And that's called faith and that's called trust. So what I want to offer to you, I want to kind of piggyback off what Ken spoke about last week in a fear of the Lord, reverential, reverential fear. And I want to offer some very practical ways of how we can apply the fear of God in our lives in 2022. We have to talk the talk and we have to walk the walk. And these are very simple yet practical ways. And if you apply, if we apply them to our lives, it will open the doors of heaven and God will shine magnificent blessings onto our life. And I'm not blowing smoke. Okay, I, th these are things that I try to put into practice in my own personal life and I've seen God move he's opened my eyes to things that I couldn't see before because I had changed my perspective in the way that I talk and in the way that I walk okay and so that's what I want for you too if you're not quite there yet so let's get down to it we need to talk the talk in our reverence for God and the first point I have there is keep the Lord's name highly esteemed. Keep the Lord's name highly esteemed. Look what it says there in Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Now, when we say taking the name of the Lord in vain, what that means is uselessly or substituting God's name as an adjective or even a curse word okay our culture this has spread very aggressively in our culture and has become very popular with even within the Christian community to say oh my God very flippantly or to use the name of Jesus Christ Jesus Christ did you see that that is using the Lord's name in vain and uselessly and needlessly we're substituting the name of God for simple words and the name needs to be held highly esteemed their oxford dictionary uh, tells us there are 172,000 words in an english dictionary my friends i know you are very creative people you can say mashed potatoes you can say peas and carrots but as Christians, we are not to use the name of Jesus in the name of God in a useless and needless manner. Why? Because that name is above all names. And that name is to be revered. It's all about R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Rosemary? Sing it. R-E-S, yeah. Respect. I want you to partake in this little um, experiment with me for a moment. Imagine approaching your own mom and dad by their first name. Ooh, kind of a scary feeling right there, isn't it? Unsettling, an unsettling feeling. Now, here we have the God of all creation. He has created all things. He has made us particularly special. He has offered us grace and mercy and unabounding unconditional love that name is to be respected and held above 
all other names. It is the name of Jesus that is above all names. You'll want to write this verse down. Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11. Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, those who are on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. There is no more glorious name. 172,000 words in the English language and they all pale in comparison to the name of the mighty risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ it is Jesus whom you serve not men it is the Lord God Jesus who is your Savior not no man it is Christ and it is that name that is above every name you know just imagine the scene one day every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to the risen Lord and Savior you know he went out like a lamb he's going to come back like a lion he's going to come back with eyes and flames of fire he's coming back to judge he's coming back to make things right Jesus Christ is not a long haired sandal wearing hippie Jesus Christ is a man of strength. Jesus Christ was a stone cutter, a stone builder. Tectone is the word that was used in the Greek. Jesus Christ was not a weakling. Jesus Christ was a strong man. And Jesus Christ will come back as a strong Savior. He will separate the righteous from the wicked. He will separate the wheat from the chaff. And he will take you, my friends, based upon your faith in Jesus Christ, and he will gather you into his barn. And you will forever be with the Lord. Why? Because you are proclaiming that you love God. How do you do that? By submitting yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Not Buddha. Not Muhammad. Not some other false and useless God. Not a God made out of human hands, of clay, of stone, of wood. But the true living God. Jesus. It is Jesus whom you serve. And it is Jesus who is Lord and Savior. And that name is to be held in high regard and highly esteemed. And I want to thank my young son, Jordan, for directing me to a website that gave a parental review of a recent movie we were going to watch because we were able to see just how many times, uh, how many dirty words were in that movie and how many times they use the Lord's name in vain. And it changes what you're going to watch. You know, we feed our minds. We feed our ears and our eyes with all of these things. And there's great opportunity. And it's so easy for us to adopt the language of the culture, right? Things just slip out, right? And subconsciously we say things. But I'm challenging you today to hold the Lord's name in high honor and high regard. This is where many blessings will come from. Here's another thing that I'm challenging you to change. The word lucky. This is a very practical application here. The word lucky. You and I know that God is all powerful. You and I know that God is in control of all matters. Therefore, you and I know there's no such thing as luck. Luck does not exist. And you say, well, what's a big deal? Doesn't mean I don't love God if I say the word lucky. You know, we don't have mean intentions when we say it. It's just a word. And I understand that. And you're correct in saying that. It's just a word. But it's a word that contradicts at the very core who God is and it steals glory from God. Right. When we say I got lucky, we say, God, you had nothing to do with this. And so lucky is a word that Christians need to delete from their vocabulary. It's going to be tough 
but we can do it together. At the chicken dinner, we will not say lucky. <laughs> and then we'll write that on top of the box. Don't say lucky. <laughs> Give them their chicken. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Don't use the Lord's name in vain. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Enjoy your chicken, right? <laughs> We're having fun. Recently at work, we have this storage cage where we keep a lot of very expensive products in there that we need for our job. And there's a, a combination lock on there. You spin it around. There's four separate numbers. And you line the numbers up and blah, blah, blah. It opens up, right? Well, there's been someone there that leaves the first three numbers of the combo in line. So all they have to do is spin the last one, right? And so anybody with any sense that wanted to steal things out of there, just go by there for the next 10 days and each day just try a different number on the last number and voila, you're in there, right? And so our language, using words like lucky and using the Lord's name in vain, what it does is it allows the enemy to steal blessings from us just like that a storage cage that we have. The combination is right there. Look, we want God's blessings. Do you want God's blessings in your life? Absolutely you do. Do you want the Lord's face to shine upon you? Absolutely you do. Do you want the Lord to answer your prayers? Do you want that? Absolutely you do. Well, if you don't respect God's name, why would you expect him to answer your prayer? Shouldn't you respect the name of the one who you so desperately need? So church, let's challenge ourselves to hold the Lord's name in high regard and high esteem. Now, the other way that we can talk the talk in our reverence for God is to show reverence for God on social media. Colossians 4, 6 says this, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. That's a wonderful verse there and a very challenging verse for us to uphold. We want to use our social media accounts as a platform for good. Now, the challenge to this is, quite honestly, social media is easier than talking. I mean, when I'm talking up here, you guys here, I stumble over my words quite often. And when I'm not here, I stumble over my words even more. It's easy to say the wrong things. Fortunately, we can go back and we can apologize for the things that we've said. It's even easier on social media. You can print, you can type it out, you can look at it, you can read it, you can reread it. And you still, you have all this time to think about it before you hit send, right? <laughs> you have all of this opportunity to do the right thing. And yet we have many in the church, and I'm not saying this church in particular, but the, the global church that are misusing social media and getting caught up in emotional banter that is meaningless and needless, right? We don't need to broadcast our our opinions on everything right what we need to do is we need to uphold the glory of God and oftentimes it's what we don't say that's more important than what we do say so we can use social media as a force for good I recently heard some very good advice it was on a I believe it was the Dave Ramsey program it was uh, financial advice and a young man called in he had just finished paying off his college loans and he called in he said you know I'm very conflicted um, they have this loan forgiveness that they're offering but I really don't feel right taking it and they're like well why not why don't you feel right taking it and so he posted a big long thing on social media explaining his points of view and and explaining why he didn't feel right taking it and what they said to him they said hey why don't you do this why don't you and your wife discuss what you want to do in this situation and then keep it to yourself and they said that because what he had posted on social media had actually exploded and caused this big fight and a lot of division and it was a lot of people that were friends of his family members of his they thought that he was having a holier than thou attitude like you're better you're so good that you won't accept this loan forgiveness but that wasn't his position he was trying to just be a principled person about it right 
He said, I signed a contract to pay back my loan. I want to pay back my loan, right? So that's how he felt. But the advice they gave him, I thought, was golden. Make a decision with your wife. Talk it over. Go ahead and do what you're going to do. And don't tell anybody. Keep it personal, right? So we live in a culture now where people, every decision they want to make, la, 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 there it is what should I do what sh what should I do what should I do and I'm not saying it's all bad I'm saying it's a very dangerous precedent folks we've got to be able to make decisions in our house you know man and wife and children whatever the situation is in house in house right so we can revere God through our talk we talk the talk we hold the Lord's name in high esteem and we use social media to project an image and a glory of God that we want people to know. But we also revere God further in our walk. Okay, so we have to walk the walk in our reverence for God. And these are very simple things you've heard me say over and over again. But I can't emphasize enough how much we have to put this into practice. We must read and study the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. This is a verse that is very dear to me, and this is a driving force for me to continue studying and reading the Bible. Look what it says there. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. God is our loving Father. Don't you desire approval from your Father, your earthly Father? I know I always wanted my dad to approve of the things that I was doing. I believe every son and daughter wants approval from the mother and their father. They want to know they're doing the right thing. God tells very plainly, you're doing the right thing when you accurately handle the word of truth. Accurately handle the word of truth. I want to tell you something, folks. The Bible is God's written revelation to us. Everything you want to know about God is right here on the printed pages of your Bible. We have to study the words, the context, the tenses. That's why it's so important to study the word. God doesn't want us making up a God in our heads. We discuss this very thing in Sunday school. Everybody has ideas. Everybody has feelings and thoughts and opinions. But God has said, listen, put that aside. I have revealed myself to you, to the world, through the written word. That's why nobody can kill this book. Nobody can kill the Bible. You know, they try. They try to burn it. They try to take it away over in China now still, and even Russia too. They do not want people having a Bible. You know why? Because when people read the Bible, the Holy Spirit energizes them. And you know what? They're willing to die for freedom. And that is scary to people who want control and authority. When you have people that are willing to die for their faith in the risen Lord Savior Jesus Christ, that is scary to a government who wants control of all things. It is the word of God. I want to read to you something that we have on our statement of faith here at this church in regards to the Bible. Listen to this. We believe the Bible composed of the Old and New Testaments is God's revelation to us, written by human authors who were supernaturally guided by the Holy Spirit. Amen. As the inspired word of God, it is without error in the original manuscripts and serves as our supreme and final authority. I will say that again. As our supreme and final authority in all matters about which it speaks. Do you want to know what holds all authority in this church? Creekside Church, you know what holds all authority in this church? You better not say a man. You better say the Bible. 
you better say the word. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And the Bible is his written word. All supreme authority and all matters are to be surrendered to the Lord. Look, <clears throat> a half hour message on a Sunday morning isn't enough. I don't care who the preacher is. It's not enough. You can't go through the week like that with, if that's all that we get. It's not enough food. It's not enough spiritual uh, food for you to take in. We have to be in the word. We have to read the Bible. We have to study the Bible. You know how adamant I am about presenting you the word, right? The Bible says that a pastor, his responsibility, this is what the Bible says about what a pastor is to do. Listen up. A pastor is to train and equip the saints for ministry. That's my job. Train and equip the saints for ministry, right? That's my job. The way that to do that, I believe, is to feed you the word so that you can build and establish your relationship with the Lord through the working of the Holy Spirit. The more of the Bible you read, that's how ministries are formed organically. The leading of the Holy Spirit and your relationship with Jesus Christ will form ministries in this church, right? We can't sit around and come up with ideas and say, well, who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Those ministries form organically. People have to be called to do things. People have to be called to lead ministries, right? By the Holy Spirit. Now, that is very important to know because that is how you know Jesus Christ is the head of the church. We're letting the Lord do the work here. Listen, my friends, the Bible is the best proven plan for life. And I'm going to quote something else I heard earlier this week. You don't pay a personal trainer hundreds of dollars an hour and then tell that personal trainer, well, I may take your advice. Where's the pizza, right? You don't do that. Who does that? Who pays that amount of money to a personal trainer and says, well, I may take it. Who spends lots of money on a diet plan, right? You have these special foods delivered to your house and you say, well, I'm not going to do that, right? That doesn't make sense. You wouldn't do that, would you? If you did, then you wouldn't be surrendered and submitting to that plan, right? And so the Bible has proven over and over again that it is the best proven plan for a man and a woman's life. And we better be paying attention to what God has to say to us. Uh, have you ever tried to walk down an escalator that doesn't move? I did that earlier this week. It was an escalator and it was not functioning. It was not moving. It was the, one of the hardest things I ever did in my life. And I'll tell you why, because it has these grooves in it and there, these lines are running straight down and it played this incredible mind trick on me. And I stepped on it like this, like Elf, right? In the movie there, he's going up the escalator. I was going down it and it's like, whoa. And I tried to catch my bearing. I went all the way down this thing, you know, several steps with that unstable, unsteady feeling on this escalator. My dear friends, listen to me very carefully. Without consistent Bible reading and study, we will go through this life unstable and unsteady. Folks, we have a wonderful Sunday school class. We have a lot of uh, opportunities to study the scripture. Take advantage of those things. Grow in the word. Spend time with the Lord. When you read the Bible, you're listening to God. You're listening to God, and then you want to talk to God, and you share your heart and your mind with God. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, here's the part I want you to focus on, the last part. You might want to underline that. Let your requests be made known to God. Let your requests be made known to God. Share with him your heart and share with him your mind. Um, I let you, I'm a very honest talker in my relationship with God. And I do it in a very respectful way. I hold that name high with a complete understanding of who he is and his power and his authority. 
But when I'm angry of something, I tell him. And I get very specific about what I'm angry about. When I'm sad, I get very specific. Because I'm communicating with God. So I don't withhold information that's in my heart and in my head. I lay it all out to him. Why do I do that? Because I trust him. I trust that in my conversation with him, he is going to refresh and restore my soul. I trust that he is going to take those burdens off of me and that he is going to lift them. He's going to put them on his back and he's going to nail them to the cross. And then I can function with the rest of my day, with the rest of my week. You know, I would strongly encourage you to allow the Lord into your life by being very honest with him and telling him exactly what you feel. And my friends, it's a great evil to think this. Well, I don't need to share that because God already knows everything. Let me tell you this. You're right. God does know everything. But it's what we don't know about ourselves that God wants us to know. When we express it out loud, then what it does is it allows our spirit to connect with God's spirit. And God communicates back to us through the written word most of the time and says, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to go. But we never get to that place unless we connect to God verbally. It's easy to say, well, I don't need to pray, but God knows everything. You know, we're going to, I, th I would hope to do it in November. We're going to have a class, I think, on a Saturday uh, around lunchtime with a lunch provided where we're going to go through Scripture and we're going to uh, teach how to pray through scripture because oftentimes our prayer lives become stagnant and it's hard to think what well, how can I pray what can I pray about so we're going to offer an opportunity to sh teach how you can use the scriptures to pray intimately with God and how to jump start your prayer life and it's a good technique that you can use each and every day and we're going to do that class and I hope to do it in November but I would like to share something with you from my heart um, when I came into a relationship with Jesus Christ, um, the Lord instructed me to, to get learning, to get into Bible college, and to begin study. And this was not convenient for me. I had, my wife and I had very young children at the time. She was staying at home. We were on one income, and things were tight. And so this did not make sense. I had very little time, very little money to do this. Yet the burden on my heart to do it was such that I could not ignore it. And so I said, you know what? I, I so desire not to be a hypocrite. I so desire to have a genuine relationship. I'm going to follow. I'm going to trust. And I'm going to see. People would say, why are you in Bible college? And I would say, I don't know. I have no idea. I said, I don't know what's going to happen or where I'm going to be or what this is going to lead to, but I do know that God is asking me to do this. And so now all these years later, it makes sense to me, but it makes sense to the people who thought I was nuts to do this, to do that. And it could look that way. God is looking to speak to you in a very intimate way and he's got things planned for you. And I want to be an encouragement to you today that you may be a little fearful of what God may be putting on your heart. I want you to know that he is going to be there with you all the way. And I want to also let you know I'm going to be there with you too. If there's something that you're struggling with, we have people here who are ready to pray with you right now people who are willing to share their hearts with you and to help walk you through this process. You are not alone in your walk. God is there. We are here. You have a good faith community right here in this church. Please take advantage of it. I would love to see more prayer inside these four walls after the service is over. Don't be afraid to come 
and have prayer. I know I've got a man right there, Chuck Oglesby, who will pray with you. A man right there, uh, Ken Lidekin, who will pray with you. There are women in here who will pray. I know Rosemary will pray. My, what, would you pray with somebody? <laughs> Amy will pray with somebody. Of course, that was just a joke. There's people in here. I know you all can pray. Let's pray together. All right? And let's not leave people alone. Walk with God by reading the Bible and sharing your heart with Him. Walk the walk and talk the talk. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you with all our hearts. Father, what we desire more than anything is for, to see your movement in our lives. And Father, I know that you're just waiting for us to continually surrender more, to give more of ourselves to you, to show us that trust. And Father, I'm so anxious to see what you have in store for our church and the people in our church. You're going to do amazing things. You're going to take people by the heart and you're going to change their lives and you're going to put them on a different path and they're going to enjoy it. Even though it may be a little scary at first, they're going to love it and they're going to love you more for it because the trust that they have for you is going to grow. Heavenly Father, pour your richest blessings down upon this church now. Let our church grow with a heart of love for you. Let us be a pillar of truth in this community to a lost and dying world. Father God, let us stand on the high ground of your word and of your heart. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Sunday message by Pastor Nick Stringer at Creekside Church in Brookville, Indiana. For more information, you can go to www creekside-church.org find us on the website once again you've been listening to the Sunday message with Pastor Nick Stringer